going to put it on the bottom of the date, right click and paste it, one, two, three. Uh, I'm going to do the same thing, I'm going to add them up. So in order to add them up and flip the sign, make it a negative number, I'm going to say negative of brackets, the 30,000 plus the 68,000 plus the 120,000 brackets. First, a word from our sponsor. Well, actually, these are just items that we picked from the YouTube Shopping Affiliate Program, but that's actually good for you because these aren't things that were just given to us from some large corporation which we don't even use in exchange for us selling them to you. These are things that we actually researched, purchased, and used ourselves. Acer 27 inch monitor. I've been using an Acer monitor as my primary monitor for a few years now. This is the first Acer monitor that I have used after having used a series of different brands of monitors in the past. The Acer monitor has been performing well and I'm trusting the Acer brand more and more as I use the monitor. I have a 27 inch monitor, which I think is ideal for what I do, which is of course the screen recording and the editing. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com where we have many different courses. You can purchase one at a time or have a subscription model giving you access to all the courses. Courses which are well organized have other resources like Excel files and PDF files to download and no commercials. So all I'm doing is just adding up the 30, the 68, the 120, then making it negative. So that's a negative 218,000. If we credit something 218, we're going to have to debit something 218. I'm going to do that with a negative of this number. Take that number, flip the sign. You could just type in a positive 218. And what's that debit going to go to? And you might say, well, we paid for labor. That's payroll. Payroll. We know that payroll, usually, if we think about the past uh, problems that we've taken a look at, payroll goes to payroll expense, usually. But in this case, we paid payroll for the youth people's work to make inventory. And that's the thing we got to kind of wrap our head around when we start talking about inventory, because a lot of people just start to think about things like payroll and utilities as expenses inherently in and of themselves. But the only reason they're expenses is because we have consumed them in that time period to help us generate revenue. In this case, we didn't consume the wages to help us generate the sales in this time period. We paid for the wages to help us to generate uh, inventory, these accounts. So we need to debit not an expense in this case, but an asset. That asset being the inventory, more specifically the inventory that's not yet done, that being the work in process. So work in process has a debit balance. We're going to make it go up by doing the same thing to it, which in this case would be another debit. So I'm going to copy that. We're going to put that in C C10, right click, paste it, one, two, three. All right, now I'm going to make this a bit smaller. We're going to post this to the general ledger. So I'm going to make it a little smaller so we can see the general ledger. I'm going to scroll over here so that we can see more of the general ledger as well as our journal entry. Work in process is here. Work in process is here on the trial balance, fourth account. Work in process is, is um, over here on the general ledger, fourth account. We're going to scroll down to the next transaction in U10. So U10 equals that 218. That's going to bring this balance up to 651, which we can also see on the trial balance. We will then post the cash. Cash is here. First account on the trial balance. First account on the GL. We are in the credit side, R9 equals, and we're going to point to that 218. That's a credit cash has a debit balance bringing the amount down to 200 which of course we could see over here as well now we have affected once again the work in process area we need to back that up with the cost sheets as well by job and you'll recall that by job we have the uh, 14 15 and 60 broken out in this way so we're going to post this 118, breaking it out into the uh, 30, 68, and 120 in accordance with these three jobs. So let's scroll all the way over here again to our job cost thing where we have our three jobs. Those three jobs being the 14, 15, and 16. As of the, uh, what is it, the 12th, 112, we, I'm going to scroll over to the direct materials column now and break it out in accordance to what we were seeing in our data. So 30,000 of the payroll is going to this this job 
And you might think, well, aren't we're going to expense it sometime, aren't we? Well, yeah, when we sell job for uh, 14 or when we complete it and or when we sell the inventory related to what is being made in that job in the form of cost of goods sold. That's how we'll expense it. So then when we have the, we have 112 over here and in column uh, uh, AO, but also in the direct labor column, we're going to put the 68,000. So we're going to increase uh, uh, that job. And then we're going to scroll down here to job 16 on 112. And in the direct labor column, we will include 120,000. Notice that, that the payroll is not being allocated uh, evenly here. Obviously, in this case, we would actually know wh where uh, each employee worked. Why? Because hopefully when we attract, when we track the payroll, we uh, are recording which jobs these individuals are working on. Uh, when we move to the overhead, that will not necessarily, that won't be the case and we'll have to figure that out. But we can now see that the jobs add up to this 651. That 651 is also seen on the general ledger and is also seen on the trial balance. Therefore, we're looking good there going to bring it back up in the taskbar to 100%. Scroll over to the left and see what we have next. Going to skip a line. We are now on 116 where it says uh, applied factory overhead based on predetermined overhead rate uh, of direct labor. All right, so here's the thing that usually people get a little bit uh, confused on and that's going to be the overhead. So what's going to happen with the overhead is that uh, overhead is going to include a bunch of stuff that we're going to include in there, including down here, we'll, we'll apply this stuff in there later, which is the indirect materials, uh, factory utilities, factory rent, depreciation on the factory. If you work any kind of book problem, anything that says basically on the factory, if you're working a uh, job cost or a process cost, then that's part of overhead because these types of things, and th some of these things, again, are some things that people just, in just have ingrained in their head that they should be an expense. For example, utilities expense. I mean, utilities, <laughs> we usually think a lot of people are just going to say, I hear utilities, that should be a debit to utilities expense. But that's not necessarily the case. If we're paying the utility bill because it helped us generate revenue in accordance with the matching principle, then yes, it should be recorded in utility expense uh, at the time we paid it or used it. But if we use that utility in order to create an asset, such as inventory, in this case, then we need to put it in terms of the asset. It needs to be included in assets. Then it needs to be expensed when we sell the inventory in the form of cost of goods sold. So uh, for anybody that has kind of ingrained in their head certain types of expenses as always being an expense, uh, you got to kind of rethink that and say, no, nah, I mean, why is utilities expense? This time it's utilities being paid on the factory and the factory is being used to make uh, inventory. The inventory hasn't yet helped us make revenue yet. It's an asset. Therefore, that utilities needs to be included up here in inventory. Now, if you think about these things, though, if we have a warehouse and we're making a bunch of stuff in the warehouse uh, and, they're, and they're all different in size, then we can't really just take these amounts, for example. Like we can't just take these three amounts, group them together and divide by, in our example, three jobs. Because remember, the three jobs are all different in size. So I can't just take whatever's in overhead and, and divide it out by the number of jobs. And we also can't apply the utility directly to a job. I don't know how much of the lighting of the warehouse we spent on any particular job. So then the question is, how are we going to allocate utilities to the jobs? I know that we need to, but we can't do it evenly because the jobs aren't evenly sized. And we can't apply it directly to the jobs because we have no way to do so. So we're going to arbitrarily do it in some way. Bigger jobs should get more of the overhead. Smaller jobs should get less of the overhead. How are we going to do that? And we're going to use some kind of cost driver to do that. We're going to say, how do we know if a job is one job is bigger than another job? One way we might say, we could say, well, if one job takes more labor hours than another job, then that's how we're going to decide how big each job is in relation to each other. That's what we're going to do in this example. Uh, we could also, if, if something is very machine intensive, we can look at machine hours. How many machine hours does one take versus the other? So we came up with a 50% of uh, labor and and that's an arbitrary number so that that I mean that number we came up with it's an estimate that we came up with it has nothing to do with labor overhead has nothing to do with labor or payroll that's just an estimate to make us see and see how large the jobs are 
So what is happening here is we're putting money into a factory overhead. We don't have any in there yet, but we will allocate as we go through this job. Those things will be allocated in here in this example. And uh, then we're going to allocate it from factory overhead to the work in process based on an estimate. Uh, and that estimate is based on direct labor in this case. So let's see what this is going to look like. Basically, what's going to happen is raw materials is going to go up by us allocating all this other stuff that we think is going to be uh, expensed in the form of overhead, all this miscellaneous stuff. We're going to apply that to the job uh, when we allocate the payroll to the job, when we allocate the labor to the job, because we're using the labor to help us do that allocation. So we have work in process here. Uh, it has a debit balance. We need to make it go up by all this miscellaneous stuff that we're going to estimate that is going to be into each job. We're going to make it go up by doing the same thing to it, which in this case is another debit. So we're going to copy the work in process. We're going to put that on top in cell C13, right click, paste, one, two, three. Now, how are we going to calculate that estimate? Well, it's going to be 50% 50, 50 of the direct labor. So I'm going to just say it equals the direct labor we just did times 0.5, 50% of direct labor. Enter. So we're going to allocate 109. Again, this has nothing to do with actual labor, payroll expense in this case. All it has to do with is estimating how much of all that overhead that we are going to uh, incur and just put into the overhead bucket we should allocate to each individual job based on an estimate that we have made. All right, so then we're going to have a credit for the same amount, negative of this number, and the credit is going to go to overhead. Now, notice there's nothing in overhead yet, and that's okay. We're going to allocate it to overhead as we incur the costs, and then we're going to apply them to the jobs uh, based on a predetermined uh, estimate and rate. Okay, so we're going to credit overhead. I'm going to copy overhead. And we are going to paste it one, two, three right here. All right, so we're going to make this smaller, back down to 80%, scroll over here a bit. We're going to post this out. We're going to post this journal entry to the general ledger. Here's the work in process. Here's the work in process up here. Here's the work in process on the general ledger. We're going to increase it by the third amount that is in there. Remember, we did uh, raw materials, then labor. Now here's the work in process in U11 equals. We're going to point to this 109. That's going to bring the work in process up in the general ledger as well as in the trial balance then we're going to post the overhead here's the overhead here here's the overhead here we're going to go to the overhead that's like the third to last account right here on the assets so we are in the credit side this case so we are going to say equals and then in cell v25 point to the 109 that's going to make this account go in the credit direction so it looks like we're overdrawn now because we haven't applied anything to overhead yet but there's the 109 credit then uh, we also need to back that up on the general ledger. So we're going to scroll over to the general ledger. We have the 109 here. We need to back that up on the job cost sheet. So this is the general ledger. We're going to back it up on the job cost sheet. So we're going to scroll over to the job cost sheets over here. We got job 14, 15, and 16. So in job 14, as of the 116 in this case, we're going to go over to the factory um, overhead. And we're going to do the same calculation we did uh, in the journal entry, but we're going to do it by job in this case. So I'm going to say this equals the 30,000 direct labor we apply to job 14 times 0.5. And then so 15,000 of uh, overhead, we're going to apply there. All, this, all the other stuff, the bucket of stuff. Then we're going to go over here to AP 11 equals the direct labor of 68 times 0.5. So we're just using the direct labor to allocate the overhead. This case, we have 34. Notice we're not allocating the overhead evenly. Idea being that the jobs are, are different sizes. Idea being that this job's a lot larger than this job based on the fact that there's a lot more hours being spent on that job. So then we're going to go down to AJ20 in the factory overhead column for job 16 equals the 120 direct labor times 0.5. So there we have that. And if we highlight the 15,000, the 34, the 60, it should add up to the 109 that we recorded on our journal entry. If we add up all the jobs now, we, we now have this uh, 760. That 760 should also be seen on the general ledger under work in process right there. It should also be seen on the trial balance under work in process right there. And so we are looking good. I'm going to make it large again and back to 100% on the taskbar, scrolling all the way to the left, we can see our next transaction now.
So we are on 120. 120 says we have indirect labor paid and assigned to factory overhead. All right, so we got indirect labor. So basically the question being, is cash affected? And in this case, we're gonna say, yeah, cash is affected because we're processing payroll again. So this is processing payroll. We're gonna simplify the payroll entry and just say that we are paying cash at the time we process the payroll and cash has a debit balance. We're gonna make it go down by doing the opposite thing to it, which in this case is a credit. So I'm going to copy the cash, going to put that on the bottom of the date, right click, paste, one, two, three. The credit will be for the 14, negative 14,000. We will then debit something for 14,000. Now you might be thinking, well, we already did something where we processed payroll. Why are we doing this? Uh, that was direct labor. You told me that was payroll. Why is payroll down here again? Well, we could have processed the payroll at the same time, but the difference between direct labor and in this case, indirect labor is that the direct labor, we know that those are people that are working directly on the job. Indirect labor are things that uh, we can't apply directly to a job. So say we have a supervisor that's supervising a bunch of different jobs and we don't know how much time he spent on any particular job. Then we would just put supervisor salary into overhead and just allocate it based on this predetermined rate that we had just we've already allocated using. Or if, if there are things in the factory such as um, janitorial service or, or stuff like that within uh, the factory, then though, you know, maintenance and all that kind of stuff of the factory, then uh, that type of thing, we can't apply to a specific job as well necessarily. And therefore we're gonna put it just into this